Evolutionists often tout natural selection as the mechanism responsible for the varieties of life on this planet. But they seem to forget that natural selection only selects. It cannot create. Essentially, survival of the fittest does not explain the arrival of the fittest. In an attempt to cover up this glaring hole in Darwinism, they will often bring up random mutation. But they seem to forget that, for molecule-to-man evolution to be true, there must be some method of adding new information to the genome. When asked for just one example of a mutation causing an increase in information, even Richard Dawkins was at a loss for words. The fact is that all genomes are slowly becoming weaker and weaker, losing information as they replicate. Organ Organisms do not improve over time simply because their genes continue to become weaker and weaker. How can anyone believe in evolution when one of its main necessities just isn't there? I had to investigate. On September 16, 1997, Kezia Video Productions in Australia conducted an interview with Richard Dawkins in his home in Oxford. In the course of the interview, Dawkins was asked for just one example of a mutation which adds information to the genome. Dawkins then appeared to be at a loss for an answer for several seconds before asking that the camera be shut off. Can you just stop one? I think. I'm recording. Immediately after, Dawkins gives a completely unrelated answer. Which says that. Uh, fish turned into reptiles, and reptiles turned into mammals, and, and so somehow we ought to be able to look around the world today and look, and look at our ancestors. We ought to be able to, to see the intermediates between fish and... Since this incident, Dawkins has alleged that his moment of silence was due to him being duped into the interview and that an argument which ensued was edited out of the video. Whether or not Dawkins was stumped or simply pondering how to handle deceitful guests, he had already answered the question in depth over the course of at least four books. The Blind Watchmaker, River Out of Eden, Climbing Mountain Probable, and A Devil's Chaplain. But the question itself does need some clarification. To put it simply, DNA is comprised of four nucleotides. Adenine, guanine, thymine, and cytosine. Any information in the genome, new or old, is a combination of those four particular nucleotides. In a DNA strand, adenine always pairs with thymine, and guanine always pairs with cytosine. Essentially, one side of the DNA helix is a negative image of the other. When the DNA change is split during reproduction, both halves are completed by matching nucleotides to their opposites on each strand. When complete, every sequence of three base pairs catalyzes for the production of a specific protein. This is where our our first test of the creationist argument appears. What exactly constitutes new information? In another episode, I'll be discussing what exactly scientists mean by information. It is certainly a lot more vague than the common definition, but for the purposes of this episode, I'm sure we can agree that, at the very least, information in the genome is a gene or sequence of genes which catalyzes some sort of protein or how it is arranged in the organism. To illustrate this, a sequence of cytosine, thymine, and thymine catalyzes for the production of the amino acid leucine. If, however, in the process of copying, two of the nucleotides are switched, resulting in the sequence thymine, cytosine, and thymine, the catalyzed amino acid would be serine, chemically distinguishable from leucine. Whether or not this constitutes new information, the result is a completely different protein and is a different sequence, and it is new to the genome. This brings to light the fact that evolution doesn't directly predict that new information would be introduced to the genome. All it really predicts is that gene frequencies change over time. On the other hand, it is also assumed that the first life was very basic, so therefore additions to the genome resulting in a larger amount of information must have happened if the theory of universal common descent is valid. Unicellular organisms have several ways of increasing the size of their genome. In conjugation, two separate organisms fuse together and trade genes before separating again. This often results in one of the resulting genomes taking novel gene sequences from the other, thereby increasing the size of the the genome. In transformation, the unicellular organism appropriates foreign DNA or molecular machinery and adds it to the genome, thereby increasing the size of the genome. Horizontal gene transfer is very common in prokaryotic life but it has also been observed in eukaryotic life. Plants, animals, and fungi can also increase the size of their genome through horizontal gene transfer, although at present it appears to be very rare. One of the most common methods is via viral or bacterial infection. To exemplify, when a retrovirus infects a cell, it inserts a copy of itself into the genome. As the cell reproduces, it may experience a copying error, which disables the virus from ever activating. Often, these endogenous retroviral genes do serve a function in the overall genome and continue to mutate 
state over time, but they do constitute new and different information. Another method by which any organism can gain a larger genome is by a simple duplication error. This results in two copies of the same gene sequence. Both copies are free to mutate independently, resulting in two distinct gene sequences in the now larger genome. A well-known example of this was discovered in 1975 when a paper authored by Hiroske Okada from the Department of Fermentation Technology at Osaka University appeared in the journal Agriculture and Biological Chemistry. Okada and his team had examined a species of bacteria gathered from ponds of wastewater from a nearby nylon factory. The species was isolated from the sludge in the water and observed for weeks in an Erlenmeyer flask. To the team's surprise, the bacteria had developed an enzyme which allowed them to ingest and break down nylon 6, which had only existed since its invention in 1935. The enzyme identified was named nylonase. In 1984, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science published a paper by Susumu Ono of the Beckman Research Institute in Duarte, California. Ono examined the gene sequences of these bacteria and compared them to the genes of related bacteria. It had already been suspected that the enzyme originated from the POAD2 plasmid in the genome, which is normally 472 residues long. What Ono found was that the plasmid responsible for nylonase was actually an imperfect copy of the POAD2 plasmid, which had been duplicated and truncated to 392 residues and causing several frame shifts and resulting in an entirely new and different sequence of genes. The question that was presented to Richard Dawkins presumed that an addition to the genome would have to come about by a single mutation rather than the accumulated effects of multiple mutations or any number of other methods by which the genome grows. Even with these faulty assumptions, it is still another example of how creationism taught me real science. If there's a creationist argument you think I should investigate, please comment below. It may become the basis for a future episode. In the meantime, subscribe and make sure you don't miss it.